Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing thrombosis and antithrombotic drugs. Okay, so we're now in the process of discussing antithrombotic drugs. Okay, so we're currently discussing drugs which are capable of producing clot lysis. Now, uh, we've seen streptokinase and also this drug anistroplase, which is a mixture of anisoylated streptokinase and plasminogen. Okay, now both of these drugs work by um, converting plasminogen into plasmin within the plasma, and by the way, both of them are given as intravenous injections, okay, um, and when they convert plasminogen into plasmin, the plasmin enzyme will break down fibrin strands into fibrin degradation products. And then when you break down the fibrin's network within a uh, thrombus, that causes the thrombus to break apart, so-called clot lysis or thrombus lysis or thrombolysis. Right. It's also referred to, let me just uh, give you another piece of terminology. This process of breaking fibrin strands down into fibrin degradation products is also termed fibrinolysis. Okay, so that's a piece of terminology you may well hear. Now, there are some other drugs which also work as um, fibrinolytics, okay? So, they also activate plasminogen into plasmin, okay? So, two drugs which also work in this way are alteplase and deuteplase which are also both given intravenously, and they'd be given if you suspected that someone had a uh, thrombus which was still blocking a blood vessel, so a thrombus was still in existence, it was still blocking the blood vessel when you wanted to get rid of it, then you would give intravenous injections potentially of alteplase, and also another drug capable of doing this, which is deuteplase, and these drugs are used in occlusive stroke. Okay, right. Um, now, I want to also discuss some drugs which are not antithrombotics, um, but uh, which seem relevant to what we're discussing here. So there are actually some drugs which are capable of inhibiting the enzyme plasmin. So these are actually exactly the opposite of these drugs here. So these drugs are antithrombotics. They are going to promote fibrinolysis. The drugs that I'm going to now discuss will stop fibrinolysis, so they're actually pro-thrombotic. But if you have got excessive bleeding, then these drugs may well be necessary, basically. So, two drugs that are capable of inhibiting plasmin, then. Okay, so plasmin inhibitors are what we're going to discuss now. So the first is a drug known as aminocaproic acid. Okay, and I want to show you the structure of this because it's so simple. Okay, so aminocaproic acid we'll start off with. So this is a drug which will competitively inhibit plasmin. So it will go into the active site and it looks very like lysine and it binds to the uh, active site of the plasmin and stops it from functioning. So aminocaproic acid. Okay, so aminocaproic acid. So the full name for aminocaproic acid is epsilon amino caproic acid, but often people just abbreviate it to amino caproic acid. Okay, so let me now tell you what the structure of this is. So for, to understand the structure of this molecule, we need to know what caproic acid is. So, what is caproic acid? So caproic acid is basically a six carbon carboxylic acid. So here's the carboxylic acid group. And then we need six carbons. So we've got three so far, four, five, six, okay? And I'm already regretting drawing out a molecular structure. Now I've got to stick 11 hydrogens on painstakingly. Oh, not quite 11, actually. I'm saved. Oh, no, I do, because it's caproic acid. Okay, so we'll try and combine this in to make it a little shorter for me. Okay, so caproic acid would be the six carbon carboxylic acid. Okay, so this is caproic acid if we stuck a hydrogen on there. Okay, but we don't want caproic acid. In fact, I will put the hydrogen on there. We want epsilon amino caproic acid. And by the way, caproic acid's new name, its modern name would be hexanoic acid. So it's not really referred to as caproic acid except in biochemistry anymore. Chemists will call this hexanoic acid. Okay, so epsilon amino caproic acid. 
basically the naming of the the old naming of the carbons of a of a carboxylic acid is to call the first carbon the alpha carbon, the second carbon the beta carbon, the third carbon the gamma carbon, the fourth carbon the delta carbon, and the fifth carbon the epsilon carbon. So we're just using the Greek alphabet here. Okay, uh, so. Um, Epsilon amino caproic acid means that you've got an amino group of this sixth carbon here, this epsilon carbon. Okay, so you're going to stick this amino group on in place of this hydrogen. So imagine pulling one of these hydrogens off here, and instead binding this amino group on there. Then you'd have epsilon amino caproic acid. Okay, so its modern name would be to call this six, because this is the sixth carbon of the molecule, six amino hexanoic acid, but epsilon amino caproic acid is the old name, and biochemists like the old names. Okay, right, so what does this drug do? Well, basically, this drug is capable of going into the active site of plasmin and inhibiting it. So it will stop the degradation of fibrin strands into fibrin breakdown products. So it is pro-clot formation. Okay. Now, if you are bleeding excessively, then you want hemostasis. You want um, the formation of secondary hemostatic plugs that are going to seal the holes in your blood vessels. So, if you are bleeding excessively, then amino caproic acid can be used to promote uh, the formation of hemostatic plugs, to promote hemostasis. Okay. A drug which does the similar thing is tranexamic acid tranexamic acid. Both of them are uh, plasmin inhibitors, so they both go into the active site of plasmin and inhibit the active site of plasmin. Okay, and excuse me, I'm just sorting out the light problem. Okay, so tranexamic acid and amino caproic acid, they are both capable of inhibiting plasmin. Now, they are not antithrombotics, they're quite the opposite, they're pro-hemostasis, uh, or pro-thrombotic. Um, but they seem relevant to what we're discussing, and they are relevant to what we're discussing. They're relevant to the pathway we're discussing, so they fit in quite nicely here. Okay, right, so back to uh, an antithrombotic then. We're going to talk about a very famous drug now, uh, the drug which they're recommending that all over 50-year-olds take now. Uh, well, it's not statins, it's instead aspirin, okay? So, the drug aspirin. What does aspirin do? Okay, well, aspirin is going to act on the platelets. Well, aspirin acts all over the place, and because it has many different effects. I mean, this is used as an anti-inflammatory, it's used as an um, a, a analgesic, um, but we're going to discuss its cardiovascular benefits, its anti-thrombotic effects. So, do you remember long, long back when we were discussing the hemostasis pathway, I told you that we were going to discuss aspirin, because aspirin was involved in uh, blocking platelet, platelet's release of thromboxane A2. So remember, when you get platelet activation, and where's my picture of this? So when you get platelets activated, is this the picture I want? Yes, this is the picture I want. So when platelets uh, are exposed to collagen and tissue factor, it leads to the activation of those platelets, and those platelets start producing from boxane A2 and ADP. Now, ADP goes on to cause a chain reaction, but the overall effect of platelet activation, remember, is to lead to this massive rise in thromboxane A2. And thromboxane A2 causes the vasoconstriction, and also it makes the platelet sticky by activating glycoprotein 2b slash 3a. Okay, so let's now discuss how aspirin is going to work. And aspirin basically is going to stop the production of thromboxane A2 by platelets. So how do platelets produce thromboxane A2? Right, so if we draw our platelet here, the platelet has a phospholipid bilayer. So we're going to start off with the pathway by which you produce thromboxane A2. So the platelets have a phospholipid bilayer, and within the phospholipid bilayer, what they have is they have Phospholipids. So let me remind you of the structure of phospholipid here. Okay, so this is my cartoon structure of phospholipid. So, 
this horizontal line here, which I'm colouring in in green, this represents the glycerol backbone of the phospholipids. So this is glycerol, or uh, the proper chemist's name for glycerol is to call it propane 1,2,3-trial. So let me just put that here, propane 1,2,3-trial. Okay, now this is a free carbon molecule with alcohol groups coming off every single one of the carbons. Then what you have is off this glycerol molecule, you have two fatty acid molecules esterified to the first and second alcohol groups of this glycerol molecule. So these are fatty acids. And again, the chemists have a more proper name for fatty acids. So the chemist's name for fatty acids is just that they are long-chain carboxylic acids. Okay, and they are bound to the uh, glycerol hydroxide group, well, hydroxyl groups uh, by ester links. Long-chain carboxylic acids. Okay, then finally, uh, in turquoise up here, you have the phosphate group linked to the third alcohol group of the glycerol molecule by a, a, a phosphoester link. Okay, and this whole molecule now is known as a phospholipid. And the phospholipid by there uh, consists of these phospholipids. Okay, so, basically, if you want to produce from boxane A2, what you do is you start activating an enzyme in the phospholipid by there, okay? And this enzyme is known as phospholipase A2. Okay, so this is phospholipase A2. So the activation process of platelets will lead to the activation of phospholipase A2. And phospholipase A2 is often abbreviated to PLA2. Okay, so let me colour this enzyme in. So in orange here, this is phospholipase A2. Now, what is phospholipase A2 going to do? Well, basically, it's going to cleave uh, the bond between this alcohol group of the second carbon of the glycerol molecule and uh, the carboxylic acid group of this fatty acid that is in position 2. Now, what fatty acid do you uh, usually have in position 2? And by the way, this is why it's called phospholipase A2. Phospholipase A2s always cleave this bond here, the second um, bond of the uh, phospholipid. So you're going to cleave this off, okay? And you're going to get two molecules then. You're going to get your free fatty acid, and then you're going to get what's left, which is this glycerol molecule with one fatty acid now bound, and then um, the phosphate group still bound. Okay, so... We'll now colour in the fatty acid in pink here. Okay, now I'll tell you what the names of these two molecules are in the next video.